Okay, so the, the topics we will be talking about are an overview. We recall some key aspects about the resource that we normally use for gas turbines, so natural gas. And then we will define the two main technologies, the gas turbine and the combined cycle, which is uh, an advanced energy conversion cycle that puts together a gas turbine with a steam cycle to produce electricity. And finally, I will give you uh, an introduction to one measure, which is the levelized cost of electricity, which we will use very often also during the exercises uh, and, uh, and so on uh, uh, in the course. So, if you want to see a gas turbine, you have one. You see it uh, in the mechanical in, uh, engineering building. Uh, it's, uh, the, um, it was probably used, actually, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because if you look in the, um, on the website where, where this, the news is reported, it's, not, it's unsure how the turbine got to EPFL. Uh, apparently, it was used uh, between 1945 and 1959 uh, in, um, in a power plant in Switzerland. And then it was brought around the 70s to EPFL. So there you have also colors to show low temperature low, and, and uh, high temperature parts of the turbine. It's interesting because it, the structure that you see in that turbine, of course now the, it's a simplification and now the turbines are more advanced than the one you see there. Um, but it can give you an idea of what we're talking um, about today. And as you go on the video that I put there at home, you can see that uh, uh, it has been also used uh, as, a, as, a, musical, as a, mu a musical instrument, so I, I leave you to discover how that, uh, how that works at home. Okay, so the first thing I would like to know before starting the lecture is uh, uh, to ask you in an anonymous form if you like uh, the, the fact of having this little interaction and more interactivity that we're trying to add in this course or in a, is an experiment that we're using this year, so I would like to know if you feel uh, that it's something that's helping you, or if it's something that, uh, that doesn't. Raise your hand if you're still logging, logging in or still answering. So I give you, uh, so I give you some more time. Okay. So let's close uh, the poll. Let's see. Okay. Actually, so we'll try to continue. We'll try to continue doing this. Then there will be a couple of questions also today. Note that if you answer E, you fall in. Uh, in uh, logical contradiction. <laughs> it's something like the Pinocchio paradox, if you know about it, or anyway, you should Google it. Uh, so let's, uh, let's mention uh, the, uh, the, some, some key items about uh, uh, natural gas. So I won't spend much time on this. You have seen already something new in the first lecture. You know that uh, natural gas consumption overall uh, is, uh, has been increasing in the last years, and it is also expected to increase in the future. Actually, we see that it is globally, it is already it is projected to overtake coal, and it is already overtaking it uh, today. If you look at the graph here on uh, the lower left, it has an increasing share, especially for power generation, so for electricity production. And uh, you see that even if uh, renewable energy sources are increasing in share, the share of natural gas in percentage over the uh, overall consumption for power generation is uh, being constant or even increasing over time. So what are the reasons of this? The reasons are because here there are listed some pros and cons uh, um, about uh, natural gas. So first of all, the, the main reason is that compared to other fossil fuels, it is a relatively clean fuel, it has less emissions 
uh, it produces less emissions, the CO2 emissions, for example, compared to coal and oil. And it is also cleaner in, the, in combustion, in the sense that you have less, uh, you don't have emissions, for example, of particulate matters and so on, or these values are very low, so the impact on human health and other criteria is also, um, is also better. And it allows, in general, a very good combustion and to reach high efficiencies. Nonetheless, it is still a fossil fuel, so as you know, we will eventually run, run out of it. As you remember, in the first lecture, I told you that the current reserves of natural gas are for, are for around 50 years. And one problem that we have is that there is also the main component is methane. And methane has a very powerful short-term impact for climate change. And then re the recent techniques of extraction, such as, for example, fracking, are quite impacting, as we discussed and as Francois showed you in the first lecture, on the environment uh, and uh, on so and it, they, there is also associated the risk of earthquakes. So the final conclusion of this slide is that natural gas will probably be the last fossil fuels that we have the interest of phase out. It can help also balancing the grid when you have a penetration of renewables. However, it is uh, not what we what should be at least the, the, the final solution. So it, it, it is the fossil fuel that can help the most, let's say, renewables to penetrate in the in, for, for electricity production. So let's now see what a gas turbine is. If you remember last time, I we discussed about cycles. So we discussed uh, that generally a cycle is uh, a system in which we have uh, an input of heat, we have a production of work, we can have a consumption of work, and we have a rejection of heat to another, to another source. So if you remember, the steam cycle we described last time, the ranking cycle, is a cycle that operates with water. Okay? So the TS diagram that we showed last time, you remember the diagram with the bell of a change of phase, is a diagram that we use for water. Here, we use another cycle, another TS diagram, which is the TS diagram of a gas. So the TS diagram, for example, of air. So in this case, we don't have, we don't have the bell. And uh, the cycle, the, the cycle here, which is the, the cycle that we use for a gas turbine, which is called the, the Joule Brighton cycle, it's composed of four phases that do not use water, but use a gas instead. So you don't have a change of phase. Let's see what are these two phases, these four phases. So first of all, you have an input of work starting from ambient temperature and, atmosp and atmospheric pressure. You compress air uh, by, by adding work in a compressor to reach stage two. Then we have an isobaric, so constant pressure heating of the gas to reach point three, which is the maximum uh, temperature uh, that we reach in the cycle. Then, at that point, we have this very high enthalpy gas, which we expand in, in, uh, in a gas turbine in order to produce mechanical work, okay? And then, and we reach down again to atmospheric pressure. And then, the final step, we release heat to the environment by, uh, a, a, again, an isobaric uh, cooling. So this is the ideal Brayton cycle. We are assuming that we're using a perfect gas, so uh, we, we have constant uh, specific heat, uh, specific heat, both at constant pressure and constant volume. And we have a, here an ideal cycle. We don't have any losses in terms of uh, entropy. We don't have any losses uh, in terms uh, of pressure. Okay? So this is how the cycle uh, is designed on a TS diagram, okay? Let's look at how it looks in reality. So how do we actually build this cycle? As you see in the mechanical engineering building at the PFL, it, it, it is built like that. So we have a shaft on which we have linked a compressor and a turbine. We have, and we have in this case, in the idea cycle, two heat exchanger to provide heat to the cycle and to remove heat on the cycle. And the work which is produced is produced on the shaft. So we have, you have to imagine uh, that you have this shaft to which you have uh, connected both the turbine and the compressor. The turbine will produce work, the compressor will consume work, and the net amount of work is the actual uh, work which is uh, 
uh, given <laughs> at the shaft and which is then converted to electricity with the generator. Okay, so very similar to what you have seen for the steam cycle, it's just that here we have a different process because we use a different fluid. We use a gas, in this case we use air, to, uh, to drive the entire cycle. So this is the theoretical Brayton-Joule cycle. Let's look at, uh, let's derive what is the efficiency of this cycle. So the efficiency, if you remember, is the net amount of work that we, that we produce over the heat that we input in the system, okay? So, here we can demonstrate that if you remember from the, the thermodynamic lecture, when we have an ideal cycle, uh, when we have an ideal cycle, we can decompose it into an infinite amount of very small Carnot cycle working between the different temperatures that we have. So in this case, we can divide this cycle into very small Carnot cycle, and we can calculate the efficiency by saying that the total efficiency, so you use this formula here, for each of the small cycle, the amount of work produced is equal to the amount of heat that we have in input multiplied by this one, which if you remember, is the maximum efficiency we can obtain from a cycle, is the Carnot factor of the cycle, right? So for each of these small ideal cycles, we can apply this formula and we can integrate. The thing that, we have, that you have to remember here is that uh, we have uh, this, for an ideal gas, in an ideal cycle, this ratio between these two temperatures is always the same, okay? So you see that the two temperatures change, but they follow the same isobaric lines. So as a property of an ideal gas, you, you know that Tc over Th is constant, okay? And thanks to this, you can bring this item outside of the formula and derive the theoretical efficiency of an ideal Brayton-Joule cycle, which depends only on air, which is defined as the pressure ratio between the high pressure here and the low pressure here, and uh, the uh, type of gas that we're using. <coughs> Okay, so the final efficiency expressed by this equation depends only by R and on the type of fuel that we're using. Okay, so I'll write down this thing also on the blackboard so that you remember these things because they will be useful for the rest, for all the rest of the lecture. So when we have a Brayton cycle, we operate between a low pressure and a high pressure. The cycle has the theoretical idea cycle has first an uh, adiabatic compression, isentropic compression. Then we have an isobaric, so constant pressure heating. We have an adiabatic or isentropic expansion in a turbine. So here we need the work. Here we input the heat. Here we produce work. Here again, through sorry, this should follow the line, of course. Here we release heat again with an isobaric, uh, uh, with an isobaric cooling. Okay. And what are the key parameters that you have to remember in this cycle? So you have R, which is the pressure ratio, which is equal. To P2 divided by P1. So the two pressure at which we are operating. Okay? Then the other property that you need to remember is that for each of these cycles, the ratio between the temperature for an ideal gas will be constant and will be equal to R, which is the pressure ratio, as minus theta. Theta is a property of a fluid, which is defined as gamma minus 1 divided by gamma, as you see up there. Uh, there is uh, a minus there, uh, sorry, it's not really shown there, but the, if I'm not wrong, uh, there is a minus here. So, so theta is defined like that, and gamma 
is the ratio, is a property of the fluid, which is the ratio between the specific heats of the fluid, okay? So the final efficiency that you have, the theoretical efficiency, is one minus R at the minus theta, okay? So remember these uh, key uh, items that, that you have, that you know, because they will be important for the to follow the rest, uh, the rest of the lecture. And remember that the efficiency of this cycle only depends on the pressure ratio and on gamma. So it depends on a decision variable that we have, the pressure between which you operate, and uh, the uh, fluid we're using because gamma is a property of the fluid. And something I don't understand. Why would you say that TC over TH is constant? Yes, the ratio between the two is constant. Yeah, so it's a property. It's a property that the ratio between the two is constant. So the two temperatures are not constant, of course, but the ratio between the two for an ideal gas is constant. Okay, and this is an important property that allows us to do the derivation and to bring uh, the item outside uh, the integral. Okay, so I spent a bit of time on this first slide because it's quite important, and then it, it allows you to better understand uh, the other items. Okay, so again. Given this formulation, uh, increasing the high temperature, the hot temperature, does not impact the efficiency of an ideal Brayton Joule cycle. Why that? Because the ratio of the cycle between the temperatures will, re will always remain the same. Okay? What influences the efficiency of the cycle are two things. The first one is that we can have a better pressure ratio. So, as you see from the equation, if you increase R, you have a higher efficiency, or you can change gamma. Changing gamma basically means changing the fluid. As I told you, gamma is a property of the fluid. In this case, for example, for air, is 1.4. For argon, is 1.66. So, if you change fluid, if you increase gamma, you have a higher efficiency. Let's, see, let's look at another aspect of the uh, brayton joule cycle, which is how much is the work we produce. So we don't care when we have a, a, a gas turbine, we don't care only about the efficiency of the cycle. We also need to produce an amount of work. So the amount of work that we produce over the cycle, which is equal to the difference between the work produced by the turbine and the work consumed by the compressor, is equal uh, to this relation here, which is basically an, uh, the application of the formula I put on the, on the blackboard before. And now we can look at some extreme points in this diagram. So the diagram that you see here is basically plotting this relation at different values of uh, T3, which is the only variable that we change in this case. So if we look at some extreme cases, if we put in this equation R equal to 1, <coughs> We are in this point here. So we don't have any difference in the pressure, okay? So these two lines are basically overlapping one to each other. So we have zero efficiency and zero work production, okay? We have the two lines are the same, so what we're doing is that we're taking some gas, we're heating it up, we're cooling it down. No work production. In other case, if you do a mathematical trick, you put R equal to this value, you get to this point up here, number two. You get a very high efficiency, but you are not producing any work. So you are, you are, raising, you are having uh, the temperatures ratio equal to the Carnot factor of the cycle between the two temperatures, but you are not producing uh, any work because you don't, because you are, you are, you are actually setting uh, the efficiency up here, and if you, if you do the calculation, you see that the work here is zero. So, what you want to do in a cycle, you can derive this equation to find the maximum. You can derive it over R and put it equal to zero. And you find for each fixed T3, for each uh, maximum temperature, you can find that the maximum amount of work is this point up here, okay? So when you design a cycle, you want to have a trade-off between the efficiency on the left-hand side, and the amount of specific work that you are producing. So these are the two key variables that you look at when you design a gas turbine 
cycle. So let's now see what happens in reality. You remember that I told you last time when we studied the steam cycle, we don't have uh, isentropic uh, compression and expansion. We always, due to the second, principle, second law of thermodynamics, we always have losses. So we have, we, have, we have what is called an isentropic efficiency of the compression and the turbine. So we still have an ideal gas, we still have a closed cycle, but now we replace the ideal compressor and ideal turbine with the real compressor and the real turbine. And if you remember from last time, for the turbine and the compressor, we can express an isentropic efficiency, which is equal to the ratio between the uh, real work of a turbine, for example, and the uh, ideal work that we could extract from it, which allows us to derive the same formula that we had before, but this time for a cycle with real turbo machines. So we are gradually moving from an ideal cycle to a real cycle. Okay? So in this case, what changes is that uh, we insert in the, in the formula other components which are the efficiency of the real components. Okay? So unlike the formula that I showed you before, so as you, as you remember, uh, we had, if you remember before, we had that by increasing R, we were always increasing the efficiency of ideal cycle. So by increasing the pressure ratio in the formula there, so we always increase the efficiency. This is not the case if we have real turbo machines. Why this? Because in real turbo machines, the temperature difference matters. Okay? Because you see, we cannot say anymore that uh, this pressure ratio, that this temperature ratio, sorry, is, is always constant because we don't end up in the same point there. So that the efficiency, in this case, depends also on the ratio of the temperatures. And actually, we can show that for each value of the ratio of the temperature, we can find a, 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 we can find a point of maximum efficiency. So differently from what we saw before, we can find uh, an ideal pressure ratio which maximizes the efficiency at each given ratio of the temperatures. Okay? So this is the difference between a real cycle, let's say a cycle using real turbo machines, in an ideal cycle. Now let's move to what is a real world cycle. Okay? So we started from the ideal, we passed through um, an ideal cycle with real turbo machines. Now we look at the real cycle, how it works in reality. So as you can see from the graph, the real cycle is actually quite different from the reality, from the ideal ones we mentioned before. Why this? Well, first of all, we have a real gas, so we cannot assume that the specific heats are constant. We have pressure losses in the different components. We, we do not really, we are unable to remain at the same temperature. And the main difference is that the cycle is open. So in reality, we don't have, in, in reality, we don't have up here a heat exchanger. What we have is a burner. So what we do is that we enter in the compressor with air. Here we have a combustion chamber where we put the fuel inside with air to have the combustion. And then we expand a mixture of fuel and air in a turbine. And then we reject it to the atmosphere. Why this? We cannot close the cycle anymore because we cannot have all the impurities and the CO2 content in the fuel back at the entrance of the compressor again, okay? So the real Brayton cycle, the real gas turbine, is an open cycle in which you inject air at the compressor, you increase the pressure of air, then you burn fuel, and then you expand everything in a turbine, and then you reject it to the atmosphere, okay? So the advantage of this cycle is that we can reach higher efficiencies because we don't have a heat exchanger. We can go up with uh, the temperature here. Uh, the, the contrary, the, the, the con, is that we cannot really choose the, arc, the working fluid. If we want to have combustion, we need to add air inside here. Okay? So this is a real cycle as you find it in gas turbines uh, everywhere. Let's look at some real value for the cycle. So here I just put you some real value. And actually, what I would like you to do here is to take two, three minutes and do one calculation. So 
I put a little exercise asking you, given this data, this input data that you have here, what is the first low efficiency of this cycle? And then what is the second low efficiency of this cycle? So for the calculation of the second question, you can assume, as a simplification, this is not, of course, the reality, that uh, the, temp the maximum temperature of the cycle is, like, is a constant heat source at 1,400 degrees. So this is a simplification because, as Francois explained to you before, when you have combustion, you have actually a reduction of the temperature over time. But let's forget about it for this moment. And you, have to co and you can consider that the ambient temperature, the outside temperature, is at zero degree. OK? So now I let you a couple of minutes to, to um, check this exercise. And then I will have two different polls, one for the first question and one for the second questions. Okay, so I repeat the question. The question was, if I if I understood correctly, why? Sorry, can you lower the volume just also because we are recording? Otherwise, it is uh, we cannot listen. So the, the the question is why, if I understood correctly, your question uh, by changing the temper, do we have an impact on the efficiency? Is that is that correct? Because. Uh, well, we don't have an impact on uh, this cycle, but on Kernel we have uh, like right? Yes, okay, but here you are, okay, let's make, a dif let's make a differentiation between the different concepts. So, what I was telling before is that in an ideal Brayton cycle, ch changing the temperature does not impact because we have an adiabatic expansion, and so the ratio between the temperature remains constant. So, this is a fixed element that in the ideal Brayton cycle. Here we are referring to the Carnot factor. Not to the ideal Brayton cycle, to the ideal Carnot cycle working between T3 and T1. So this is a different, this is a different thing, okay? Because what we do in the demonstration when we show the efficiency, the theoretical efficiency of an ideal Brayton cycle, we are just considering what is the maximum efficiency that an ideal Brayton cycle could have. So we are answering a different question. When we are looking at the Carnot factor, we are asking what is the maximum efficiency that we could have by a cycle working at fixed T3 and T1. So not this variation of temperature between T3 and T2 and T1 and T4, but having two sources, one at constant T3 and one at constant T1. Okay, so it's a, it's a different, it's a different answer, uh, question that you answered. Okay. And so let me just see, do you still need time for the exercise? Raise your hand if you need, please. Okay. Okay, you have some. But then we can, like the Brighton cycle can have a efficiency superior to the Carl cycle. No, this cannot uh, cannot happen because uh, the ideal Carnot cycle will have. Uh, the, so the question is, uh, uh, if the Brighton cycle, the ideal Brighton cycle, can have an efficiency higher than the Carnot factor, it won't, because actually, if you look at the real at the Carnot cycle, uh, you have a variation in the temperature. So your actual supply and demand temperature are rel respectively lower and higher than the extreme temperature of the Carnot. So the Carnot, the idea Carnot cycle will work between a higher delta, delta temperature. Is it clear? Then now I have to leave this slide, but if you want later, we can check in detail with the diagram and it will be clearer also the explanation.
Okay, so raise your hand if you need still time. Okay, I'll leave you still another some seconds because otherwise we will end up too long with the lecture. Okay, so let me close the poll. Uh, let me let me sorry. Let me open the poll, and you have first the possibility to answer to the first question. So, what is the first principle efficiency? And secondly, to answer to the second question. So, what is the second principle efficiency? So still someone who needs to answer? OK, so let me close this first poll and pass to the second one. Then you can, of course, uh, take the time to redo the exercises with uh, uh, time at home. OK, so 83% answer correctly. Let's open, uh, let's open the second one. So what is the second law efficiency of this cycle? Okay, so let's close also this. Uh, still, someone calculating? Okay. So let's see what the second law efficiency is. Okay. So I, uh, the, I if I'm not wrong, here you have the answers. So the, the first law efficiency, let's recall, the first law efficiency is the ratio between the amount of water we're producing and the input. And to calculate how much input we're giving, as you saw before, we have the mass flow of natural gas times the lower heating value here. Some of you answer 83% in both answers because you confuse the first and second law efficiency with the Carnot factor. So the Carnot factor gives you the maximum theoretical efficiency that you would have if you would uh, uh, produce, uh, if you would have a cycle working between 1,400 degrees and zero degrees with the Carnot cycle, okay? So answers basically the question that he was asking before. Yes? Um, about the glass, it's 50 uh, times 4.5, but it's a kilojoule, and then one is a megawatt, so it's 
Yeah, you're right, yeah. Sorry, it's, uh, here there was a mistake in the slides. It's a megajoule per kilogram. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to see if you were paying attention, let's say. <laughs> let's put it that way. So here, the 50 is, of course, a megajoule per kilogram. So if you have an error, if an error factor 1,000 in your, in, your, in your exercise, it, it, is, it is for that. So here is 50 megajoule per kilogram. So you have megawatt and megawatt, of course, and they go away. The Carnot factor gives you the efficiency of an ideal cycle, an ideal Carnot cycle working between these two temperatures. The second principle efficiency, if you remember, compares the real efficiency of the cycle, so the first low efficiency, compared to the maximum theoretical efficiency, which is the Carnot factor, and is 53%. Okay? So this exercise uh, took a bit of time, so I suggest you that anyway, so you have also the information in the video, I finish uh, the, the lecture until the combined cycle. It will take another 15 minutes or so. And then, uh, uh, so then you have all the, the material. Yes? No, so here is not zero, the E plus. Here, what you have is that, as I said before, the turbine and the compressor in a gas turbine, they are shafted on the same shaft. So what you have is the net power, which is the difference between E minus minus E plus. So E plus is not zero. It's just that this E minus minus E plus is E net. So if you have other question about the exercise, which I see, let me just finish this, uh, this part, and then you can come later and we can discuss them. OK? So let's see how we can increase the efficiency of a gas turbine. So you remember last time with the steam cycle, we discussed how we can the increase the efficiency of a steam cycle with different ways. We have similar ways for a gas turbine. So one way that we have in a real gas turbine is that, first of all, we have to define the optimum pressure ratio. Then the other thing we can do is increase the maximum temperature to T3. This we can do, but of course we have a limit given by the materials, and that's why one of the key parameters in a gas turbine is the fact of cooling the blades. Then we can, given the same amount of work output, we can decrease the heat input. So this is normally done what is, with what is called regeneration. When you have the uh, heat, the, the heat, the exit at high temperature from the uh, turbine, you use this heat to preheat the hair before the combustion, similar to what we saw for the steam cycle. Then we have two measures that can allow us to increase the work output. And these two measures are the, what is called the intercooling. So doing compression in two stages by and having an intercooling in between. This allows to decrease the work of a compressor, so we can, by doing two-stage compression, we have a more efficient compression. And the same thing, we can do it in the turbine. So if we do a reheat in the turbine, which basically means uh, after the first expansion, we reheat in the combustion chamber and we expand again, then we can increase the work output. So these are the three measures that uh, you have available in a gas turbine to increase the efficiency, okay? So here you find on Moodle three slides about the details of this three items, which are not so relevant for the lecture now, so I leave them to you. What I want you to show is that by improving, by doing these improvements, you can increase the efficiency of a gas turbine. So if you see in this graph, here you have, you have the efficiency of a standard gas turbine, so the simple cycle. What you see is that for a simple cycle, the optimal pressure ratio is around 45. If you add regeneration, what you see is that uh, you don't have a variation in the work output, but you have an increase in efficiency, especially at low pressure ratio. So usually you have interest in doing regeneration for small gas turbine, for small application. Then you see that if you want to increase the work output, the main measure that you can do are reheating and intercooling. And uh, you see the reheating and intercooling so these complex cycles up here that you find in real gas turbine are particularly effective if you couple them together with regeneration. Okay? So as I told you, a key aspect is that if you want to increase temperatures, you need to cool the blades. 
So, because the blades, of course, have limits of a material, otherwise they might melt. So your idea here is that uh, if you have internally, you have a gas at a given temperature, this is the, this is the, the blade wall, the, this is the blade, and this is the external uh, temperature, let's say. What you want to do is possibly to find measures to bring this internal temperature of the blade as low as possible and possibly equal to Ti. So, you can derive an equation to represent this heat exchange, so convective heat flow and conductive heat flow. And then you see that the things that you can do is either try to find measures that uh, increase the value of Hi, the convective tra heat transfer uh, um, coefficient, or K, which is the conductance, so increase Hi or K, or you can decrease the value of Ag, which is the convective heat transfer of the gases. Okay? So these are the measures that you can have. And uh, uh, what, I would, what I would say is that just to briefly describe these measures, what is called impingement basically means that externally, at the, the blade turbine, you have a very high convective flow, so you have a convective flow at very high speed. And uh, uh, you, this allows you to increase the heat exchange on this side. In the same way, the film cooling means that on the other side of the wall, you, you, have, you have little holes in the blade of the turbine, out of which you have cold air passing, and this creates a film of cold air which protects the blade of the turbine. And the third measure, which is the thermal barrier coating, basically just means that of coating the, the blade here in order to increase uh, its thermal resistance. Okay? So this is a slide in which I added more details that you can, that if you want to look more in details into these three aspects here. So I will close the lecture by showing you the different types of gas turbine. And I will let, uh, for the last part, so I will introduce the combined cycle next week at the beginning of the lecture, between, before the lecture on uh, coal and nuclear, because I want to take uh, enough time to explain it in detail. And uh, so let's look at the four types of turbines that we normally have in the market. They are normally classified into the first type, which is heavy duty. So heavy duty are normally the big turbines. You see here values of, for example, 300 megawatts. Quite efficient, even if not extremely highly efficient. And these are the ones, the kind of turbines that you have uh, in power stations. The goal is producing electricity using them almost the full year. So you want uh, to use these gas turbines as, uh, as much as possible because these are big installations that you have in combined cycle or in any way electricity production facilities. Then you might be interested by knowing that this gas turbine is the same that you have in airplanes in order to produce uh, thrust, to produce motion, right? So the difference is that you see, for example, this is a turbo propeller or a turbo shaft engine, which is the one you find normally in ATR, in small planes and so on. So here, the difference is that you don't have production of electricity, but you burn the fuel with the scope of generating thrust and moving the airplane uh, forward, right? The other type of uh, normal engine that you have, also you have the same engine in turbofan, which is the engine that you find in jet planes. So it's the same working principle. Uh, it's just that normally this is used in military and uh, civil aircraft, but the concept is the same. So the goal is creating thrust on the backward. So instead of creating electricity here, of generating electricity, you're generating mechanical power and thrust to move the airplane. Then you have the third type of turbine, which is called aeroderivative. So these are turbines that normally come originally from a turbine that was made for, um, uh, just wait a second, for, um, for, uh, aero, for, for um, airplanes. So basically, these turbines are turbines that are very efficient, uh, they produce, uh, but they are not used all the time. So like a turbine in an airplane, you're not, you don't use it 8,000 8, hours a year. You use it for a very short time and you want a very high efficiency. So normally these turbines, what you do is that you take 
a turbine that was used on an airplane, and then you add to it a second turbine with, in order to produce electricity out of it. And the last one are small and micro turbines that uh, you use uh, in, for a very small application. So this turbine normally are characterized by relatively low efficiency, but normally they can be used for specific application and they can also be used in order to cogenerate heat and electricity. So you can use the waste heat to do cogeneration in this case. Okay, so uh, today we will be talking about uh, the last part uh, related to gas turbine and combined cycle, which is uh, the combined cycle gas turbine. I will briefly cover this part and, uh, and explain you one key concept, which is also the levelized cost of electricity, where you have a little exercise, uh, which will be the only poll I will be asking uh, you today. So why do we talk about combined cycle uh, with the gas turbine? If you remember last week, we discussed about, uh, uh, in the previous lecture, we discussed uh, about uh, the gas turbine cycle, which if you remember is the one I put here on the blackboard. So you have on the TS diagram, you have uh, for gas, you have the, com the compression, two compressions and two isobaric heating, compression expansion and two isobaric heating and cooling. Okay, so this is the theoretical uh, bright and cool uh, cycle that we apply for a gas turbine. So what is the point with this cycle? Why, as, as you remember, I told you that the cycle in reality is not closed as you see it on the blackboard, it's open. So actually, in a real gas turbine, at point four here, we release, uh, <coughs> we release the combustion gases at high temperature to, to the atmosphere. Because we cannot close the cycle, we cannot recycle the CO2 into the cycle again and uh, all, the, all the flue gases, let's say, okay? So what happens is that when we exit from the gas turbine, we have, uh, at high te we have um, uh, flue gases that exit from the gas turbine at high temperature around 600 degrees. So there is a lot of heat in this cycle that goes waste to the environment. So the idea of, of the combined cycle is to have to recover the energy content that we have at 600 degrees at point four with another cycle, so to add a ranking cycle at low temperature in order to recover this amount of heat that we have available. So a combined cycle gas turbine is basically the combination, as the name says, between these two cycles. So we have a top cycle, which is the gas turbine up there. We have heat at point four exiting at high temperature from the gas turbine. We recover this heat in a steam generator in order to give heat to a bottoming cycle, which is uh, uh, a ranking cycle. That's the one we studied uh, last time. So basically, this combined cycle brings together the lecture on steam cycle and the, and the, and the lecture on uh, gas turbines. So you see here, the important thing is that the fluids in this diagram are always different, right? So you see that. Uh, you enter, and you can see it also in the TS diagram here, we enter with air in the compressor of the gas turbine. When we have combustion, we add the fuel into the mixture we have. We expand the fuel and the air into the turbine, okay? And then the heat from the flue gases is recovered by the water of the steam cycle. So you might remember this diagram down here is the steam cycle that we used last time. So the idea is pretty simple. It's the combination between these two types of cycle. Just to look like, as a, as a combined cycle looks like, you can see that here you have the, uh, a gas turbine, and on the other side you have uh, the steam turbine. So you have these two different cycles which are connected. And just to give you an idea, try to spot where the man is in this graph. Just to give you an idea of the size of these kind of installations. Can you see it? So there is a little, there is a little man down here, okay? So this is to give you an idea. So combined cycle is what we normally use today in large, for large scale electricity production. It's the state of the art of what we use, or what we use to produce electricity and often eat as well with cogeneration when using gas as an input. So the main component, the link between the gas turbine and the, and the ranking cycle 
is what we call heat recovery steam generator. So I won't spend much time on this. Basically, what you normally have is that the steam generator, you have to imagine to have a series of heat exchangers that take the water from the combined cycle, first heat it, then evaporate it, and then create steam. And of course, you can integrate all the uh, other things we can do in steam cycle that we presented in the steam cycle lecture. For example, you can have multiple pressure level and so on in order to reduce the exergy losses of a heat exchange between the flue gases of the gas turbine and, uh, um, and the steam cycle. So, what is the efficiency of a combined cycle? The formula to calculate it, basically, to calculate it, we can look at the two cycles separately. So, we, we call them a topping cycle and a bottoming cycle. So, the top cycle is basically the efficiency of a gas turbine. So, the heat contained <coughs> in the gas that we give in input, which is the mass uh, flow or the mass, in this case, of a gas times the lower heating value, divided. Uh, multiplied by, so at the, at the denominator. And on the numerator, we have the net output of the crankshaft, uh, of the shaft of the, uh, of the gas turbine, which is the difference between the work produced at the turbine minus the work required by the compressor. Okay, so this is the top cycle. Then we have the bottom cycle is the same thing. So is the difference between the work of the steam turbine minus the work needed in input by the pump, which is, as you remember, often quite negligible, divided by the heat that the steam cycle receives as output from the gas turbine. Okay? So this heat is not entirely transferred between, from the gas turbine to the steam cycle. That's why normally we have an efficiency, which we indicate in this slide with the Greek letter T. Basically, the efficiency of the bottoming cycle is the efficiency of the steam cycle times the efficiency of the heat transfer between the two, the efficiency of the steam generator, okay? So we can, if we put these two together, we want to get the global efficiency of a combined cycle. We can simply derive it, and at the end of it, and at the end, it is assuming that the efficiency key is equal to one, is the sum of the efficiency of the two cycles minus the multiplication of the two, okay? So, and then, of, and then of course, uh, if you don't have an efficiency of one, you, uh, you have the key which indicates the uh, efficiency of the heat transfer between the two, okay? So, rather simple to calculate the efficiency, to compute the efficiency of the, of the combined cycle. So, as I told you, combined cycles, you remember last time I told you roughly the efficiency of a gas turbine is around, uh, let's say, in the range of 30 to 45 percent, we can take a value of 42 as reference. The efficiency of, of a steam cycle can usually get up to 45 percent or so on. When we combine the two, using the formula above, we obtain the efficiency of a combined cycle, which is today, if I'm not wrong, uh, the highest efficiency ever reached by a combined cycle. I think uh, every now and then they have this Guinness Award for the best combined cycle ever. I think the last time was Siemens obtaining it uh, for a 63% cycle. Um, today, uh, what most producers mention is that we can reach probably up to 65, okay? And uh, of course, in the gas cycle, in, in the combined cycle, you can do both the improvements that you saw in the steam cycle lecture and in the gas turbine lecture. So when we talk about uh, the re heat recovery, superheating and so on, all these things can be combined and are actually combined in real cycle, okay? So let's just close this part with seeing how the gas turbine and, and combined cycle, how we use them in the market. So basically, the gas turbine today, as it is a relatively inefficient way of using the gas, it is used uh, due to its characteristic of being able to start really quickly. So usually, we use gas turbines in order to compensate the grid when we have fluctuations in the frequency, normally due to renewables uh, volatility, okay? And so it, can, it is normally profitable only for short-term users. We don't do base load. The base load is normally done instead by combined cycle. A combined cycle is a more complex system to use. We cannot start it up in, in some minutes. It takes some hours. So usually it, was, it is born as a technology to do uh, base load. Actually, in reality, due to prices of gas and competition with renewables, the role of combined cycles as base load is being severely impacted. 
Uh, as I was mentioning in the first lecture, you might remember, I told you that uh, due to price of gas and so on, we had uh, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, there were four or five almost new combined cycles that were built and put out of operation without having been even used once. I think in 2014, there were five of them. So there were huge investments that were not profitable due to prices of gas that uh, increased unexpectedly and uh, competitions with uh, other technologies, okay? And a particular use of combined cycle, you will see next week with uh, Francois Electron cogeneration. So usually it is also used for district heating network in order to produce electricity and cogenerate heat at the same time. But this is something you'll be able to see next week. So this graph summarizes what I was telling you before. If we take a lot curve, typical lot curve, which basically means uh, we put the uh, peak load on this side and we put all the hours of the year on the x-axis, you see that the gas turbines is normally used up here in order to compensate the peaks, while the combined cycle of, in general, thermal power and fossil fuels are at the lower level, and, uh, and then you have normally, in current state, you have uh, uh, runoff river and nuclear, which generally provide base load, and of course, if you have it, also geothermal or other technologies like that. So, last thing I want to mention you is how we calculate the levelized cost of electricity. So usually, when we want to compare, and you see it also today in the lecture on coal and nuclear, when we want to compare different ways of producing electricity, what we normally do is that we want to have one number. And this number to compare them is the levelized cost of electricity. So the way you calculate the levelized cost of electricity is that if you have a power plant, you sum the investment cost, the total investment cost uh, that you had for uh, the um, for purchasing the power plant, which you annualize to one year with this annualization factor, plus you sum the cost relating to operation and maintenance, and plus the operating cost, which are normally the fuel cost and the, and the cost related to CO2 emissions in case you have a CO2 tax. And this all is divided by the uh, production of electricity that you have over one year. And an important definition that you find also in the project and so on, normally when we have power plants, we refer to something which is called capacity factor. So the capacity factor is defined as the ratio between the hours of full load operation equivalent in one year of a power plant. So imagining the number of hours that the power plant would run if it was working at full time over the year, at full power over the year, nominal plate capacity, divided by the total number of hours of a year, which is 8,760. Okay? So here, the only exercise that, uh, that I have for you today is uh, I give you some typical numbers that we have for a combined cycle, and I ask you to take a couple of minutes to calculate what is the levelized cost of uh, electricity in this case. So I give you a couple of minutes because this calculation can take a little while and then I open the poll. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so still someone calculating? Do you have the data at least? Okay, so I move to I move to the if you read, write down the data if you haven't finished the calculation I give you another minute but I open the pool in the meantime. So do you have the data? Okay. So you can give your your answer here using always the same uh, username and uh, website and password, of course. Okay, so I close the poll in uh, in 20 seconds in case you can uh, you can finish the. If you haven't had time to finish the calculation, try to guess what you think it can can be the right uh, the right value, and then and then you can uh, you can finish it at home. So. Still someone answering? Wait, why do we have only nine people here? <laughs> okay. So do it now, if you still have something. Otherwise, let's see the result. Okay. So uh, the, the answer, who answered 60.6 .6 is correct. I think who answered 606.1 uh, used 5 instead of 0 0.05 for the interest uh, rate in the calculation. So remember this 5% is 0 0.05. And uh, for the other values, I think if you answer 190.4, you didn't convert uh, between the 50 ton per hour to kilogram per second for the natural, for the natural gas. If you answer 49, I think you forgot to include the investment and the maintenance cost, if I remember well the other answers. Okay? So take care again of the unit conversion between the different, uh, between the different uh, 
uh, exercise, and of course you can recheck it at home. So here in the slide on Moodle, I put the final calculation, uh, which now I think since most of you answered that this value it's luckily correct, even if I did it late at night, so still still okay. So let me just conclude this lecture on gas turbine and combined cycle. Uh, so one thing is that, uh, so these slides will be useful starting from next week when you have the project. So what will happen starting from next week, and Louise will talk to you about that uh, uh, on uh, next, uh, uh, next Monday. Every, every time we, you will be given a model of the Swiss energy system and you, you will be able to add one technology, the technology that you studied in the course to this model. So from now on, at the end of every lecture, we will give you the key characteristics of the technologies that we have in this model, and you have an Excel file where you can add this new technology to your Swiss energy systems, and by the end of the course, you have the entire system with all the technologies in order to answer some policy uh, making questions and advise what Switzerland should do about the energy strategy. And this will be clear next week. So just to recap the key message that we had in this lecture, so we saw, two te we, we saw one technology, which was uh, the gas turbine. And uh, we saw that this technology is usually a technology we use in energy system for peak loads. And it has an efficiency of roughly, let's say, 42% as an as a average number. And we saw then the combined cycle now, which is uh, the most used gas te uh, technology for gas-fired power generation. It reaches efficiency of the order of magnitude of 60 65%. And uh, it is today probably the last technology with the penetration of renewables that will be phased out as it is uh, uh, cleaner and uh, more efficient than uh, coal, coal or oil combustion for electricity production. Okay, so uh, with that, I propose you that if you have some questions, you can ask them now. We'll do like, only a three, four minutes break, just uh, the time for uh, uh, Francesco to set up uh, uh, his uh, laptop. So uh, I have the pleasure, we have the pleasure today of having uh, Dr. Francesco Baldi as a lecturer. This will happen also in the next courses. We ask to experts in different domains to come and lecture on uh, fields of uh, expertise. So Francesco is uh, also a postdoc uh, in our lab. He's, he, has, uh, he holds a PhD in energy from Chalmers University in Sweden. He joined our lab uh, one year and a half ago. And he specialized in energy system uh, design, especially modeling and design of uh, ship energy systems. And uh, he will uh, give, uh, at, uh, so in a couple of minutes, he will uh, do the, a, a shorter coal lecture on coal power generation, which will take roughly half an hour, and then the lecture on nuclear. So if you have questions, you can ask them now. In the meantime, I ask Francesco to set up his uh, laptop.